I'm pretty sure that my government was mostly interested in finding out who are my sources and trying through different means to convince them not to contact me and not to give me information about corruption or abuses of power. Last year, the world was shocked by the discovery of the Pegasus spyware, a piece of software that infiltrated smartphones of journalists, human rights defenders, active activists, and politicians, through which the data of their microphones, cameras, messages, and all other data on their phones was leaked to governments and secret services, a threat to freedom of speech, freedom of press, and a threat to our democracy. Can journalists still do their work freely if they know that they're being followed? And how are on and offline safety connected? What does that mean for press freedom? And do journalists self-censor? Again, a warm welcome to the Bali and a warm welcome to uh, Persvrijheid of Self-Censuur. have is list of phone numbers that were targeted and you are among them. And what does that program do? It's transmitting your messages, your images, just everything that's happened on your phone. Shit. Your phone was compromised. They send an attack, steal a bunch of data. The moment they do it, the phone is compromised. They can exfiltrate whatever they want. It's just pretty much automatic. We have access to a lot of information about a massive surveillance campaign all over the world that's exclusive materials. It's about who is spying on who in many countries. Journalist Jamal Khashoggi was killed inside their consulate in Istanbul. His close friends were surveilled after the murder. Es la constatación de un espionaje planetario, de un gran crimen mundial. Es una bomba, es una bomba atómica. It's a great, great honor for me to invite to the table a very distinguished journalist from Czech Republic, Pavla Holkova. She's an investigative journalist and regional editor for Central Europe at the OCCRP and won numerous prizes for her stories on crime and corruption in European governments. Can I have a warm welcome for Pavla? And then we have another very special guest tonight, and uh, his name is Sabol Czpanyi, a foremost investigative journalist from, uh, journalist from Hungary, nominated twice for the European Press Prize, and he works for the Hungarian platform Direct36.hu, and Panji writes mostly on corruption, national security, and high-level diplomacy in Hungary. Welcome both, thank you for, for being here. Um, we've been seeing this, this video of uh, Forbidden Stories, a French journalist organization who broke the news. They couldn't be here tonight, but you guys could be here, uh, so that's very nice. Um, maybe, uh, Pavla, first to you, what is the Pegasus project, and, and how did Forbidden Stories find out about Pegasus? Well, how did I found out? You need to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> I was invited at a later stage to, to join the project, and the project is about is centered on a data uh, that are actually showing how different governments of different states around the globe used spyware that's uh, infiltrating the phone and sending back to those who are running uh, the operation, every information, what you are doing on your phone, including encrypted messages, including what pin you type when you unlock your phone, including turn it on and off your cam or microphone when you are in a room, they want to listen in. 
Okay, so you said encrypted messaging. So um, applications like Signal and Telegram are not safe from from. Pegasus. No, because they actually see what you see. It's uh, they take full control of your phone. So at the moment you unlock Signal, uh, they can read the messages as easily as you do. Yeah, and Sabolt, you you were a victim of of Pegasus. Um, on what story or what stories were you working when when uh, you were followed? I was uh, I was surveilled uh, back in 2019 from April to November that year, and in that almost seven months type uh, time span, I was working on at least like five or six stories. Uh, I could uh, I could guess that it was a story about a Russian institution that was relocating. It, it's a bank it, which was relocating its headquarters from Moscow to Budapest. Actually, we were working on this story together with our uh, great uh, Czech colleagues. Um, and the, basically, the, the core of the story was that the Hungarian government was inviting this very shady Russian institution that was dubbed as a spy bank mm -hmm. to Budapest. Um, and when I was working on this story, uh, when I was having meetings with some sources, that's when my surveillance started. But it was not the Russian <laughs> government that was surveilling me, but the Hungarian. Okay, so your own government was uh, surveilling. And, and have any of your sources been compromised due to the surveillance? Well, it's very hard to tell because um, I was told almost two years later that I was under surveillance. And like I tried to reverse engineer what happened to my sources and, and what happened to the stories that I was working on. There were a couple of people who just stopped contacting me back in those days. So I don't know still if it was connected to the surveillance or not. I'm pretty sure that my government was mostly interested in finding out who are my sources and trying through different means to convince them not to contact me and not to give me information about corruption or abuses of power. Yeah, and, and how did you find out that it was your own government that was spying on you? Well, uh, as, as Pavla said, that um, uh, there are different clients of, uh, of NSO Group, that's the company that manufactures Pegasus. And we actually didn't know who's, who's the actual operator uh, of the spyware. We could guess. Um, and through like circumstantial evidence, when we published the pieces, we were pretty sure already that it was the Hungarian government because uh, all, the, um, all the targets uh, that were identified as uh, as Hungarian targets. They, they were only interesting to the Hungarian government, to no one else. I mean, um, and later on, the, my my own government did uh, did uh, uh, say that yes, it was them. After a couple of months of hesitation and no comment strategy, we cannot comment because it's confidential. So after a couple of months of that, uh, they they finally acknowledged that it was them. But they also added that uh, every surveillance was uh, uh, lawful. So I was a legitimate target of surveillance, according to them. Yeah. Is that um, what, what happened afterwards? So they said you were a legit legitimate target. So I guess they did not repay you any reparation fees or, or anything like that? Uh, no, no, we're, we're nowhere near that. Uh, currently, of course, I'm, I'm suing uh, the government, but first I, I just want to have basic information about when, why, who initiated my surveillance, on what grounds. So I, I really want to have just very basic facts, but even to get those, I have to go to court. Yeah, so this is still all very unclear. Yes. Did you have any like physical threats due to your civilians? The the case of Hungary was uh, was fortunately very different. So I myself I didn't feel any kind of like uh, direct threat or pressure, nothing like that. Uh, Hungary is still a member of the European Union, which means that our government, uh, led by Prime Minister Viktor Orbán is still required to act in a civilized manner. Mm -hmm. So these methods are, uh, are not uh, uh, viable uh, in Hungary for our government. What they want to do is that they are doing the dirty things in secret. That's why a spyware like Pegasus comes handy. And what happened in Hungary is that we identified at least uh, six journalists, including myself and my immediate colleague uh, working at Director 36 
who were surveilled with this spyware. Um, basically, these, these targets, including myself, we, we all worked on stories that were sensitive to the government. Um, as I said, in my case, um, they were after my sources probably, and, and this applies to the other people as well. Then we identified three businessmen who own uh, media companies. Uh, or, or used to own media companies, and these are all uh, the, or, or were employers of, of journalists who did independent work or who did uh, uh, journalism that was very critical of, of Viktor Orban's government. So that the tally is now nine, mm -hmm. but of course these, these media company owners were, were employing m many more journalists. Yeah. And then we had uh, at least 10 lawyers, including the most senior lawyer of the country, the head of the Bar Association. Um, we had opposition politicians and even uh, government officials of Viktor Orban's own, uh, own government. So it's, uh, it's a very diverse group of, of people and each case was, was very different. So in some cases there were consequences. For example, when a government official had a debate with his superiors over a Russian project and this government official was, uh, was basically trying to defend the Hungarian interest against mm -hmm. the Russian interest. After this guy was surveilled, he was fired. Okay. Uh, so we could uh, we could see what were the consequences here, but again, it's nothing like in Mexico or in Azerbaijan or in Morocco. Um, we see different patterns in every country. There's a systematic abuse of Pegasus, just that the governments have like different uh, uh, different um, I don't know. Uh, different way of being corrupt and different way of abusing it. Some can tie the use of surveillance with using force or even murder. Uh, some can only use the force that they have as employers, as the state, to fire people. Yeah. And how many how many countries have been affected by... Uh, is there a number? I don't know. Probably many more than we know about. Yeah. I think we, we wrote about 10 or a dozen or something like that. Yeah, but... But there are many more. Yes. Yeah. And, and speaking of, of, of the situation in Hungary, you said, already said it's an EU government. Um, how is the situation currently regarding press freedom in, in Hungary? Uh, well, we're not performing well in all of these uh, press freedom indexes. Um, I would say that the, the biggest problem is that in these uh, uh, past 11 or 12 years since Viktor Orban took power, uh, he was very successful in uh, uh, transforming the country's media um, uh, industry. And surveilling journalists is, is, is only like the latest phase. It, it could have started around the mid-2010s, but this was just one method. Um, usually the Hungarian government is not trying to kill journalists. There's no need for it. They are trying to kill the media outlets. Mm -hmm. uh, one usual uh, scheme is that the Hungarian government, through state-owned banks, they give loans to so-called independent businessmen who are just proxies fronting for the government, who use this state money to buy up the struggling uh, uh, media outlets, and then fire the journalists and turn these outlets into, into propaganda. And currently, Basically, there is a there's a cabinet member, a minister working for uh, Mr. Viktor Orban, who's in charge of coordinating the messages, the slogans that this uh, this uh, right wing uh, pro government media empire is disseminating. Mm -hmm. And how many how many uh, independent media outlets are there still left in Hungary? Uh, usually, you find independent reporting, especially investigative report, reporting, online. Uh, there are probably like four medium-sized uh, independent news sites. There are two investigative NGOs, and there are a couple of, of smaller uh, outlets. Problem is that we can only reach uh, people who live in Budapest, the capital, or some larger cities with uh, with universities. Uh, but basically, there's a there's a firewall between urban and rural Hungary. And for example, my story never makes it to the average news consumption of someone living in a small town voting for uh, the prime minister. And, and, and why is that? Because they don't have internet connection, or they do have, but they usually uh, consume news through uh, state-owned media, um, print media, radio, TV, and all of those are controlled by the government. For example, every uh, local newspaper uh, 
newspaper, every county newspaper is owned by the same pro-government group. Yeah. That, that doesn't make for a very uh, free landscape, would you say? How is that in the Czech Republic? Oh, <laughs> you know, our former prime minister, he's owner of the biggest media house, you know, he uh, he's like, you know, having this state attitude towards media he owns, but he's former now. So okay. we are going maybe a uh, few degrees up in the... Uh, in in scaling the freedom of the press. Yeah, and and has there been a reaction from the European Union on this scandal? Well, of course, and uh, Hungary was just the first country from the European Union that was hit by this uh, scandal. I think the Pegasus project only covered Hungary out of the European Union member states that were abusing. France? Uh, that were abusing. Okay. Uh, of course, there were other very high-level victims of surveillance or targets of surveillance, such as Emmanuel Macron or Charles Michel, uh, but they were targeted by non-European uh, countries, Morocco uh, mostly, I think. Uh, then after the, the Hungary case, uh, it turned out that Poland was also uh, abusing uh, Pegasus against uh, political opponents of the government, prosecutors, uh, activists. Then came the, the very peculiar case of, of Spain, where first it turned out that the whole leadership and former leadership of the uh, Catalan region were surveilled. Then it also turned out that the current prime minister and the minister of defense, as far as I remember, were surveilled with Pegasus. Uh, by the Spanish government. Yes, the Spanish government, the, the national Spanish yeah. government. And, and now we have uh, 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 the latest case, which is not uh, um, with Pegasus, but another spyware called uh, Predator, uh, manufactured by another Israeli company called Citrux. So this tool was used in, in Greece uh, to spy on one of the leaders of the opposition and on some um, uh, journalists. So currently there is an investigation done by uh, the European Parliament's uh, special inquiry committee called the PEGA committee. Uh, they are writing a report on this. They are having field trips to all these countries and they're going to come up with some conclusions. Um, the, the problem is that in order to have joint EU action against what happened, uh, you need uh, basically unanimous decisions. You need uh, the vote of Prime Minister Viktor Orban, uh, you need the vote of uh, Mr. Morawiecki from Poland. So the exact, the exact same people whose government was using and abusing uh, this tool. Yeah, so that's maybe not the, the best route to... Uh and this. Um, did it change your, the way you did your work as an investigative journalist? Uh, of course, but uh, even before Pegasus, I tried to be as cautious as possible with, uh, with my communications. Uh, one of the reasons why I came under surveillance and why certain other journalists did not was that, uh, as, as Pavla said, one of the specialties of, of Pegasus is that it can crack end-to-end -end encrypted messaging applications. If journalists are not using it, they are using, like, for example, just simple emails or non-encrypted messaging applications, there's no need for Pegasus because probably there's some other cheaper technology out there that can be used to, uh, to, to, to spy on them. In my case and in the case of the other journalists and media company owners, what, what's common in us is that we were using Signal, Telegram, WhatsApp to, uh, to have more sensitive discussions about topics. Um, so, I mean, I, I did make that mistake that to some extent I, uh, I did trust these applications. Mm -hmm. So one of the changes is that I, I try to rely more on very old school, almost like spy movie-like uh, methods, like meeting people in a park, making sure there are no surveillance cameras around, or if I'm talking with my boss, we put the phones in the, well, not in the fridge, but in a different room, in the bathroom, sometimes, you know, uh, have the tap running, and uh, silly things like that. Yeah, Cold War tactics. Um, Pavla, you've not been infected, right, by the Pegasus? <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, because okay. you, you already said it's a non-interactive uh, crack. So how did you find out that you were... Uh, Infected. Uh, well, I mean, 
when I was infected in 2019, I had absolutely no idea that my phone is uh, is uh, being uh, uh, surveilled with Pegasus. My phone was not like overheating. The battery was, of course, running low. But this is an, this is an it is an iPhone, so that's that's pretty regular with iPhones that the battery is pretty shitty. Um, so I was told two, two years after that that I became a target because they identified my phone number in this leaked database. I think we didn't tell that the, the core of the investigation was a, a leaked database of more than 50,000 phone numbers. And these were really just phone numbers, so we had to identify the people behind those, uh, those phone numbers. Um, and we had another help from the coordinators of the project because they brought in Amnesty International, mm -hmm. uh, their tech team, uh, who invented a method how to analyze, uh, well, iPhones. Uh, and uh, basically I had to do a backup of my phone, upload it to Amnesty's site or server, uh, and they ran um, an analysis. And that analysis could show the exact dates down to a millisecond uh, when some uh, a process or file associated with Pegasus was running on my phone. So I know the exact dates when someone got into my phone. I also know the amount of data that was uh, downloaded from my mm -hmm. phone, but I do not know what was actually accessed. I can only guess. Uh, the, the data was more than 100 megabytes in a seven months period which means that it was very likely not live streaming. Mm -hmm. So I usually take my phone, or I used to take my phone to the shower to, to listen to some podcast. I don't do that uh, anymore. But it's very unlikely that they took pictures or videos. Probably it was just uh, a chat logs, messages, emails, uh, as I said, signal uh, yeah. messages. And um, have you, Pavla, ever been surveilled that you know of? Or do you suspect that you have been? I have no idea, but I am really, really lame at, uh, you know, recognizing that something is happening or something is going on. So um, I still believe I haven't. That's good. <laughs> but you I, I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's not. Maybe I'm just stupid. <laughs> You should visit Hungary more often. <laughs> <laughs> but did you run your phone through the the software of the Amnesty International? A uh, different one that was monitoring the activities that my phone was doing when I was having it. When when actually uh, I have this analysis on when I was working in Mexico on those stories. Yeah. And is the research still going on, the Pegasus project, or is it finished? It's pretty much finished, I believe. Um, but you know, it's a it's a database. You know, it's you don't know what kind of a data you are going to get in a future, and maybe there will be some crucial piece of information in the, in this database or in this piece of information. So uh, it's never finished, really. And is there a research now on the? I forgot the name of the other. Predator. Program Predator. Is there also like a, a team that's researching that scandal? Uh, I know that many journalists, uh, usually uh, from Greece, but also from other countries, are trying to find out uh, other um, th who, who the other victims could be. So I think yes, there is. It's it's not part of the Pegasus project. Uh, I. Th I think I published my last piece on Pegasus a couple of weeks ago. It was about a broker company uh, that about brought what? A, what company? a broker company. Broker, yeah. So it was basically an intermediary company uh, that brought Pegasus to, to Hungary. So there are also like uh, uh, sub stories that are not actually related to the database, but about who operated the spyware, why, what was the legal background of it. And also, we're, we're following the developments, for example, what the, what the European Parliament's PEGA committee will come up with. Yeah. All right. Um, let's close this first conversation.